I enjoy reading horror and fantasy novels added with an interest in supernatural things because something unexplainable happened to me once. I experienced a horror story as a child. I thought about it a lot over the years. This story had been buried in my heart incredibly. Before talking about my story, I would like to tell you about something that happened at my grandma's house when I was little. My grandmother's house was in the countryside and was surrounded by huge mountains. The livelihood of the people there depended on the resources of these mountains, so the villagers there often went to dig mountains. The people there extracted all kinds of rocks and sand from these mountains. Therefore, it was easy to see holes of different sizes in the areas that had been mined. When it started to rain, the holes would be full of water. People were unaware of the depth of these holes and danger that lurked inside of them. The children at the foot of the mountain often went up there to play for fun. Among those children, the one who was the bravest often chose the deep holes for swimming. A couple of kids in the village who lived near my grandmother's house decided to go check it out. But when it got dark, only the younger brother returned home. The boy told everyone that he did not know where his sister had gone. Everyone waited for a long time. It was getting dark, and the older sister still hadn't come home. The adults in the family felt very worried. They began to search for her inside and outside the village. Some people in the village at the time said they had seen the two sisters going up the mountain to play around 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so they told the family about going up to the mountain to search for her. After hearing that, the adults in the family knew that a bad omen had appeared. They rushed to the quarry to look for the older sister. They started searching around the quarry and the holes. After searching for a while, the mother suddenly discovered something strange in the distance. The mother got a little closer to get a better look and saw her son's ball floating in the water hole. With a premonition that something was wrong, the mother called some family members and rushed there to see what had happened. When they arrived at the hole and looked down, people could guess that this was the deepest hole because the bottom was not visible at all and the area of it was quite large. Once again, the mother saw something on a large rock by the hole. It was a pair of shoes, and those were probably her daughters. Immediately, a man jumped into the water to save the kid. After a long time and a lot of effort, the man was able to resurface with the girl in his arms. After being saved, the sister sadly passed away with her swollen stomach containing all the water she swallowed. The mother sadly broke down, experiencing the death of her child. Then, when the mother got home, she used a broom to sweep the house and then beat her son with it. She thought her daughter's death must have been the boy's fault and she took it all out on him. Only at the time that the younger brother honestly explained what happened. That day the younger brother and older sister played football very close to the hole. The ball was kicked out and the sister did not catch it. It fell into the hole. The younger brother was unsure of getting too close because of his mother's warning so he begged his sister to go to the water to retrieve the ball. The older sister saw this and did not know how to handle it so she had to go into the water to pick up the ball. As a result, the sister slipped and fell. Unfortunately, she couldn't swim. The older sister disappeared and the younger brother on the shore was no longer seen. At that time, the younger brother was so scared that he rushed home without daring to tell everyone the whole truth. After experiencing these things, the holes in the mountains became dangerous places. The adults in the village often warned the children not to play near the holes. I was only in the fifth grade of elementary school. During the summer vacation that year, I was allowed by my mother to go to my grandmother's house to play. Whenever she saw me going out, my grandmother always told me not to go up the mountain and not to go near the quarry. I was at a naughty, playful age. How could I listen to my grandmother's advice? At first, I just threw rocks into the water, but soon realized that it was one of those holes. It was so deep that when a stone was thrown into it, it would no longer be visible. 
I threw one after another, and this time I threw it very hard into the water. Suddenly, I saw a special red carp appeared with a very large body. I didn't think much of it, but I thought I wanted to catch the fish, so I weighed it into the water. Meanwhile, I tried my best to be able to move forward, but I still couldn't catch that fish. Still, I wouldn't give up and I tried my best. Unfortunately, my foot slipped and my whole body started sinking into the water. My body sank deeper into the water and I couldn't swim at all. I just struggled instinctively. But the harder I kicked, the deeper I sank. After a while, I couldn't swim anymore. At this point, I started drinking too much water and gradually it overwhelmed me and my breath started leaving my body as I sank. I almost felt like I was about to die. And then I had the feeling that someone had saved me. I vaguely saw that it was a shape of a girl and suddenly a very miraculous thing happened. I was lifted out of the water. Because I was so excited and quickly climbed the shore, after turning my head to look back, she disappeared. I was really confused and didn't know what had happened. My grandfather and grandmother suddenly appeared and later I heard her say that when my grandmother was at home, she had a premonition that something bad had happened to me. So she came to find me. And in order not to be scolded, I lied to my grandparents that I was just hanging out near the hole when a girl pulled my leg down and I almost drowned. As a result, my grandparents did not scold me but only comforted me saying that I still had great luck or else I would have been taken down by the girl to take her place and be a ghost for the rest of my life. Although many years had passed, I still did not have the chance to tell the truth to anyone, the truth I had hidden for so many years. All I wanted to do was to thank the girl who saved me and apologize for blaming her, as well as all the tragedy she had to endure. This was a scary true story that happened to my family aunt. On the occasion of my grandmother's birthday, my parents took me home to visit and congratulate her. My grandmother did not like the hustle and bustle of life in the city, so she returned to her hometown 10 years ago and lived in the same house with my aunt. My grandmother was 90 years old but still very sharp. Our extended family had a very cozy birthday celebration. But then something terrible happened that day. Late at night, my parents and I were arranged to sleep in the next room. I was assigned a separate bedroom. While I was sleeping, I heard a commotion outside the house. I heard my aunt scream outside. However, at that time, because I was too sleepy, I did not pay much attention to it. The screams got louder and louder, and after a while, I heard the commotion of a lot of people outside. So I sat up and tried to look to see what happened. The sleepiness continued to hit me, but I ignored it and continued to lie down to sleep. I planned to ask my parents the following morning what had happened later because sleep was the most important thing at that moment. When morning arrived, I was awakened by the birds chirping. The scenery in the countryside was really different to that from the city. The fresh wind also made me sleep much better. I crept out of my room. I didn't know what time it was. I didn't hear my mother wake up like usual today. Usually it was so comfortable. Suddenly I saw in the corner of the wall a pile of ashes. This made me curious. It seemed to be a pile of banknotes and tokens that were burned last night. But why would it be here? I felt curious. Could it be that last night's fuss had something to do with these things? I also found it difficult to understand because yesterday was obviously my grandmother's birthday celebration. So who would burn paper money and votive papers like that for what? I knew that this was custom for my village traditions. However, later I was told by my parents about the night before. 
I heard my aunt's screams and everyone ran outside to check it out. At that time they discovered that she had fallen down in the yard. No one knew what had happened. Seeing my aunt unconscious, everyone expressed concern. My cousin tried to resuscitate her but the situation was bad because she couldn't see her aunt breathing anymore. However, after a period of intensive care, my aunt woke up. At this point, she appeared extremely panicked and scared. She kept shouting, let go, let go. Her face was pale and sweaty. She seemed to have seen something terrible. Then everyone thought she had seen a ghost and invited a shaman to exorcise her. The shaman quickly set up a stage and began to cast spells. It was also the first time I witnessed an exorcism performed by a shaman which looked very serious and monstrous. During the ceremony the shaman said that last night was a ghost in the south. He came to capture my grandmother's soul but accidentally caught my aunt by mistake. So to solve this problem the shaman asked us to prepare coins and gold paper to burn instead. Everything was prepared and done by everyone in my family. Only my grandmother was absent. People burned votive paper and begged the ghost to leave the place and spare my aunt. The fire was now burning brightly accompanied by the commotion of people. My aunt was also getting better. Everyone reassured her that everything was okay. She would rest fine. Having finished everything, the shaman instructed the people in the house on a few things to ensure that this thing would not happen again. That night, my family members could not sleep at all. Only I slept as if nothing had happened. My aunt then slowly regained consciousness. Her face also became rosier. Everyone surrounding her breathed a sigh of relief when they saw that she had regained consciousness. And everyone was also curious to know what had happened. My cousin reassured my aunt that everything was okay and that the shaman helped us out so there was nothing to worry about. My aunt looked happy and she felt secure. She began to recount the terrifying incident that had happened that night before. So after the birthday celebrations, Auntie washed the dishes and walked back to her room. The air that night was quite cold and suddenly she felt like someone was walking behind her. She stopped when she noticed that a man was also looking at her. She turned her head and asked who it was. Because it was dark and the person hid behind the tree, it was difficult for her to see his face. The shadow remained motionless, looking at her. She thought he was a family member, but couldn't see exactly who he was. She asked again why he tried to scare her like that. Suddenly, the shadow drew closer to her. With smoke spreading around, he looked at her with a very dark and scary look. Suddenly, he grabbed my aunt's hand, causing her to scream, and at this moment an electric current ran down her spine, she felt the fear of being caught by the hand. More frightening, that shadow tried to pull her away, pull her in, causing her to duck her head forward. At this point, she was so scared, she shouted for help. The shadow was still pulling on her, no matter how much she cried. Fortunately, because of all the screaming, everyone in the house woke up and ran out to save her in time. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it very well because it happened on the occasion of my grandmother's birthday celebration. When I was 8 years old, my parents and I moved to this neighborhood to live in a house next to a large tunnel. Apart from the boring peacefulness of the neighborhood, there was nothing attractive about the area. Only a large tunnel at each of the ends of the street was constantly attracting my attention. Every afternoon when I got home from school, I would pass by one of the tunnel's exits. It was strange that this exit for some reason was being blocked by barricades. The people of the area seemed to be familiar with this mysterious tunnel, so no one approached it except for me. With some mysterious magic, every time I turned away, the small tunnel constantly created a mysterious attraction that made me unable to take my eyes off of it. 
I thought to myself that one day when I become an adult, I would go in there to explore the tunnel and see what interesting things rest inside. Time also gradually passed and one day I became a teenager. I had a few friends who shared the same curiosity as me at the university and that day we had an appointment to explore the mysterious tunnel together. I was at the rendezvous point when it had already begun in the afternoon and after a while two of my friends also came running along. Everyone looked very excited, only I showed confusion and nervousness on my face. Over the years, the abandoned tunnel in the area where I lived had become famous and mentioned by many people, making my friends curious to explore the insides. But no matter how much my friends asked of me, for some who had never heard of that tunnel like me, I couldn't answer all of their questions. This made the mystery of the tunnel even more heightened. We discussed waiting until it was too dark to go inside the tunnel to explore. We would start from the entrance that was blocked with iron bars because we thought that was the most mysterious place of it all. And as planned, the whole tunnel was plunged into darkness. The coldness around this mysterious tunnel was shown more clearly. The place was also where we began the inside of the tunnel. When we stood in front of the barricade, we realized that it was taller than the head of an adult like us. However, getting inside was not difficult. So we decided to go into the tunnel and go further. One by one, all of us climbed the high fence and supported each other. In a few moments, they were all standing at the entrance. Inside the tunnel was a dark, mysterious and attractive color. There was no light inside, only the street lights that showed us the way. The sound of our footsteps echoed through the tunnel accompanied by the voice of each person in the group. They made the gloom and coldness of this tunnel even more multiplied. We went inside with our phones and hand to record all the scenes. We hoped to make a movie full of attractions and interesting things. As we went deeper inside, the sound of the wind blowing from inside made us feel chilly. The deeper we went, the louder the wind became, mixed with a sound like the engine of a train. We started looking at the screen, scared and worried because we didn't know where the sound was coming from. My friend thought for a while and then began to analyze. He thought that the area above the tunnel had been degraded for a long time, revealing holes that allowed the wind from outside to blow inside, creating crazy, scary sounds. The other friend in the group expressed disagreement with the last opinion because we were making videos about spirituality and ghosts. It was impossible to analyze these things from such a scientific aspect. After stopping and looking around for a while, we decided to go inside to explore more. On the way, I suddenly remembered the history of this mysterious tunnel and told my friends. This tunnel had become old and ugly because it had been built for a long time, but no one had visited it recently. This thing made the rumors about the mournful cry in the tunnel all the more interesting. As we were walking, our group accidentally discovered a small altar that was crudely erected. The border of the stone tablet was cracked and covered with dust. The incense placed next to it had also long expired. The thing piqued our curiosity even more. At first we were scared, but we thought this might be the mystery behind the tunnel. The reason that the tunnel was blocked from anything flowing around or anyone to enter and had to stop working was this small altar. We thought that the mystery of the ghost tunnel here had finally been solved, so we were extremely excited. My friends at the time also suggested that let's take a commemorative photo in front of the stone tablet as proof that we had been there. After taking some pictures, it became really dark. We did not want to stay in the dusty place for too long, so we decided to leave. But after walking a few steps, the person holding the phone recording the trip suddenly shouted, informing us that the phone was broken and suddenly the power was off and maybe the video we recorded until now would be lost away. We tried to check for memory. Luckily, before the phone could shut down, it recorded the whole process. But the joy did not last long when my friend suddenly trembled with a convulsion, his eyes showing real panic. He moved his lips and called out to us but couldn't say it out loud. Beneath his feet, a cold hand grabbed him from the ground, knocking him down. My friend panicked and screamed. A man with a white beard 
Grey hair and black eyes as deep as two holes were trying to hold my friend back. The other two of us who heard our friend shouting so loudly were also surprised, so we turned our heads to see what was wrong. In front of our eyes our friend had collapsed to the ground. The older man was trying to hold tight. We didn't know if this was blinding or true, but it was enough to haunt the group. My friend stomped on the grey-haired older man's face with all his might, and the older man was thrown away, his hands no longer holding my friend's leg. My friend's whole body was suddenly heavy. After seeing that, we immediately ran over and quickly caught our friend before the scary older man could chase us. We ran for our lives outside, not even daring to lag back for a second. My friend ran to the exit of the tunnel when he suddenly remembered the phone. So he was about to turn back, but he couldn't see the phone anymore. Instead, the fearsome man was crawling on the ground only a short distance away from which he was able to grab my friend. The three of us saw this and ran out in fear. Our screams resounded and everyone in the neighborhood heard of it. We scrambled to climb the fence to escape. Some hunch told me that as long as we ran past this barrier, our group would be safe. After getting off of the fence, I didn't forget to look back inside the tunnel as to verify what had happened was completely real. The tunnel once again spread the mystery to the outside world with its dark and cold color. But this time, I saw eyes as bright as two headlights looking fiercely in our direction and emitting devilish laughter. Later, we learned the story of the ghostly tunnel. In the past, this tunnel was used for trains. The trains would run non-stop from one station to another, so it was originally empty of people before. Until one day a careless citizen had a catastrophic accident here while he was upgrading the tunnel. He was old, moving slowly, so when the train came he did not have time to get out of the way. And as a result, the train smashed into the man, causing him to die towards the exit of the tunnel, while the other half of his body fell into the railway ahead. Because the train was going so fast and couldn't stop in time, it ran across the older man's body, turning his lower half into pieces of meat. This accident caused the train to stop working, but his soul still lingered there. Much later, after an altar was made for him, his soul could not escape, so people blocked the entrance to the tunnel to avoid unfortunate circumstances. My mother once told me a creepy story involving my uncle. She said that after the incident, my uncle left the country to work far away and had not come back for several years. The year there was a small factory that mainly produced canned food in our village. My uncle was a factory worker at the time and he was in charge of shipping and delivering goods to Asians. Every day, he also had to do the job of loading and unloading goods. He would drive the car to deliver the goods too. Although the job was quite hard and the salary was low, it was better than having to work far away and leave the homeland, so he still accepted to do this hard job. Once when the noodle harvest season approached, many people in the factory business would quit their jobs and the workforce would not be enough. So the factory arranged for my uncle to work overtime the night. From a worker, my uncle was assigned to a security guard. In fact, it was quite safe here, so it was also reassuring for him. That night, he was going to walk around the factory for a bit before going to sleep. And when he was about to return to the factory, he suddenly saw a dark figure carrying a large shovel coming up from the back of the factory. My uncle thought this person might have been a warehouse thief. He was still holding a shovel and didn't know what it was for. My uncle decided to shout at him. Unexpectedly, when the man was discovered, he threw the shovel back and jumped on the wall to escape. Looking at the figure, he looked startled, so my uncle confirmed that he might have been a thief. He ran to the wall, but the thief was quite fast. 
he managed to escape. In the blink of an eye, he jumped off the wall and ran away. My uncle at that time was giving chase, but had to stand look after the factory too. So he silently scolded the stupid thief and went back to his work. I heard that my uncle had a little drink that night, so it was his habit when something didn't go right. Because of this incident with the thief, he did not dare to sleep well. Unexpectedly, in the middle of the night, he heard a strange noise outside the door. It seemed like someone was talking to him. When he opened his eyes, he saw a figure standing in front of the door. The voice wasn't very loud, so it wasn't clear what the person was saying, but there were a few words that seemed to be calling someone's name. My uncle thought that someone had come to see him because there was usually several other workers at the factory working overtime, but this time it sounded very much like a woman. Maybe the wife of a worker, my uncle thought, but this person was way different. He wondered if any woman could come to him in the middle of the night. He couldn't help but get curious, so he got up and went to the door. When he opened the door, the woman in front of his eyes was very scary to my uncle. She was definitely a woman, but she had no body. To be precise, her head was floating in the air. Her hair was green, it looked fuzzy. She was clearly a ghost. My uncle, being stunned for a long time, finally regained his senses and let out a huge scream. Even though he had alcohol in his body, he became sober immediately, like during the day. However, after shouting and screaming, he did not feel like the ghost was intending to kill him. The head of the ghost didn't hit him like he thought it would. Instead, it just hovered in front of him, with its mouth moving and a look of pain and tears rolling down its face as if begging him. But my uncle could not hear what she said. After a while, the woman turned her head. My uncle could only see the long black hair, then it drifted towards the back of the factory. Moments later, the head disappeared into the corner of the workshop. It seemed like she wanted to show my uncle something. He was usually shy, but at the time his feet seemed to be disobedient. Automatically, he followed her or the head in that case. Reluctantly, he followed this woman's head and at a glance it was a narrow alley at the back of the factory area surrounded by large walls. The place was where the garbage was collected. Vegetable peels, eggshells, bones from the factory were piled up like hills and in the heat of the summer it turned into humus, giving off a bad smell. My uncle did not dare to do anything that night. He only looked at it for a moment and then hid in his room to sleep until dawn. It was not until the following morning when someone came to the factory to work that my uncle found a shovel and led everyone to the garbage dump. As he had guessed, the head of a dead woman was pulled from the dump. He quickly called the police and they sealed off the scene with the factory temporarily closed for investigation. The workers were given two days off from work, but the goods were still in stock, so my uncle still had to deliver these goods. About the third day after the woman's head was discovered, my uncle and his boss went to the country seat to deliver the goods. Not long after leaving the factory, they saw a large group of people gathering at the riverbank, surrounded by many policemen who were investigating something. Out of curiosity, they parked their car nearby and went to the crowd to ask what was wrong. As it turned out, a person who went to exercise in the morning discovered the body of a woman floating in the river. The police were working to recover that body. After that, a person's body was picked up from the river and placed onto the bank. The body was swollen and rotten, but specifically, it had no head. My uncle had a heavy heart. Looking back, he realized that the boss's face was not good about this. And after seeing the bus like that, my uncle's heart had a bad premonition. Later, he would be right, because his boss was the very culprit of this case, 
and he was arrested and convicted for murder. It turned out that my uncle's boss had an affair and got this woman pregnant. Because she threatened his reputation as well as his status, he decided to do a very evil thing and kill her by decapitation. It was a year when I brought my daughter back to my hometown. Something bad happened to her. Now when I think about it again, I still feel frightened. My wife and I have been working in the city away from home for many years. It has been more than two or three years since I had the opportunity to return to my hometown to visit my parents. My parents were of course very happy to see us. They were also happy to see that their granddaughter is now grown up. Things have changed quite a bit there. The house my parents lived in originally had two rooms when we returned. The one on the east side was being repaired and renovated. This time there was no room for us to stay in. My mother was going to move to my grandfather's house. But I told her to let us stay there because we didn't have to stay for long. Our family had not seen each other for a long time, so we were chatting and having a good time. After that, I let my daughter hang out with her grandparents for a while. Meanwhile, I moved my belongings to my grandfather's house. My grandfather lived there, and he died many years ago, so the house was vacant. I also very rarely mentioned him to my wife because he was a very treacherous man when he was young. He abandoned his own wife and children mercilessly because of his mistress. Until he was too old to walk, he went back to beg my grandmother to forgive him. Although my grandmother accepted to forgive him, the family did not care about him in the end. My grandfather died of tuberculosis. That night after all the cleaning was done, our whole family slept in the room that my grandfather used to sleep in. My daughter Nico also felt very scared when we were there. It took a lot of effort to get her to go to sleep. Then, my wife and I talked for a while before we could fall asleep. Around midnight, Nico suddenly shouted in a loud voice that startled both of us. She said that there was a ghost standing near the bed, reaching out to touch her. I didn't know if she was telling the truth, but to comfort and reassure her, I took a stick and pretended to chase the ghost away. But Nico also pointed at the wall and said that an old man was standing there staring at her. Even though I couldn't see anything, I still tried to pretend I did and hit the air with sticks just to calm her down. My daughter always mentioned that scary old man, so we had to coax a lot and hold her tight before she could sleep again. Nico has never said such strange things before, so my wife was a little worried, but I felt normal about it because she was still not used to the new place. The next day I told my mother about it and she was so angry that she cursed the ghost violently. She did that partly to calm my daughter's fears, but ever since she cursed, Nico had been coughing constantly. My mother thought Nico might have been choking on food, so she patted her on the back and gave her some juice, but that didn't seem to work. Immediately my mother's expression changed and told us not to stay in that room anymore because she thought my grandfather was haunting Nico. The next day, on New Year's Day, my father and a few early uncles in the family went to visit the family's ancestral graves. My wife and Nico were at home alone. My family's ancestral grave occupied an area of most of the hill, and each grave is taken care of and worshipped during these New Year's holidays. Only one of my old grandfathers had overgrown weeds. No one wanted to sweep and trim the grass in front of the grave. When I arrived I also heard my father scolding him very harshly. He scolded a lot and even threatened my grandfather to let go of my daughter and not to harm her. That scared me a bit. After we finished our work, we quickly went home. 
As soon as I entered the yard, my wife ran out in panic, saying that Nico had become very ill and had to be taken to the hospital earlier. She coughed continuously without stopping, not only that, but also vomited a lot of thick black sputum. I was so worried, and I rushed to take my daughter to the district hospital for examination. Unexpectedly, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis by someone. An extremely dangerous and contagious disease. This news was like a thunderbolt. I wondered how could this happen? How could a three-year-old child get this disease? Moreover, there was no source of infection in my house, so this was quite absurd. Nico was hospitalized. She went under treatment for a few days, but still did not improve. My wife and I were both worried and afraid. In the corridor of the hospital that day, I accidentally met one old uncle that I knew. He came to the hospital to see the doctor. He met me to talk privately and seemed a little hesitant about whether to talk to me or not. He said that Nico's appearance reminded him of my grandfather's condition before he died. He was afraid that Nico was possessed by my grandfather. Apparently, the more we cursed at him, the more damage he would do to Nico. So he told me to go to his grave to sincerely apologize and pay my respects, and then maybe Nico could be saved. I went home and told my parents the story. Even though they didn't like what I was about to do, they didn't object to me because it involved Nico's life. Right after that, I sincerely brought some incense to my grandfather's grave and paid them a visit. I knelt in front of the grave, trimmed the grass, and sincerely begged my grandfather to let Nico go because she was his great-granddaughter after all. She didn't do anything guilty. I also knelt to admit my mistake. I cried and begged not because I confessed my guilt or because I regretted something, but because I felt my Nico was too pitiful. I'd said all that could be said. I could only beg my grandfather not to haunt my daughter anymore. And the miracle happened. When I got back to the hospital, my baby Nico stopped coughing and was as healthy as ever. Just to be sure, I took her to the hospital in the big city for one more checkup. And the results this time showed that her lungs are exceptionally healthy and nothing was wrong. I don't know if it was a misdiagnosis from the previous hospital or because my prayers worked, but my daughter was fine anyway. Since then, it's been three years now, and I don't dare to bring her back to my hometown ever again.